Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to today's securityboulevard.com program, brought to you by TechStrong and Silverfort. My name is Cody J. Brown. I'm the host of TechStrong Learning, and we do have an exciting program ahead for you. First, I do have just a couple of housekeeping notes to cover. So today's session is being recorded. If you miss any of our discussion, or maybe you'd like to rewatch or share with a friend, the on-demand recording will be made available shortly after we conclude our live session today. If you have any questions, we want you to send those in to us using the Q&A tab, which can be found on the right side of the screen. And that is also where you'll find the chat tab, where we want you to get to know your fellow audience members. Let us know if you have any thoughts throughout today's program, or maybe just let us know from where you are joining us. If you navigate to the handouts panel on the right side of the screen, you'll see about four or five handouts that have been made available for you to help aid with today's program. So feel free to download those at your own leisure. And of course, before we close out, we are giving away four $25 Amazon gift cards. So be sure to stick around. So the topic of today's presentation is Identity Zero Trust, From Vision to Practical Implementation. And I'm joined by Don Huffman, Product Manager at Silverfort. Don, thank you so much for joining me. I yield the floor to you. Cody, thanks so much. Hi, everyone. It is wonderful to be here today. I really appreciate all of you being here today. Um, as Cody said, my name is Don Hoffman. I'm a Product Marketing Manager with Silverfort. Um, just one quick housekeeping thing from me, we are probably going to have a slightly shorter webinar today. Um, it's probably going to be more like 40 minutes or 45 minutes, so you'll all get some time back at the end uh, because I love to follow the principle of, of always, leave, always leave them wanting more from show business, so uh, that's kind of where I'm coming from. Um, anyway, today's topic, zero trust from vision to implementation really think this is an important topic for a lot of organizations out there because despite the fact that Zero Trust has been around for quite a long time, you know, it actually dates all the way back to the 1990s, I believe, for a lot of organizations today, it is still a real struggle. I think there are a lot of companies that this is still more of a theory or still more something that's being debated than something that's being implemented. So the purpose of today's webinar is to really try to give all of you some concrete tools you can take to take zero trust, especially as it relates to identity from something that is more abstract from a vision into something that is doable and actionable in terms of having an actual implementation strategy. So before we dive in, I'd love to just tell you a little bit about our agenda today. I'm gonna begin with a brief recap of the principles of zero trust in case there's anyone who's not familiar with that or just to kind of level set on what the definition of zero trust is. I'm then gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about this concept of identity zero trust, uh, what the purpose of that is, what the KPIs are around identity zero trust. And then we're gonna talk for a little while around the implementation challenges of zero trust and I bet there are a lot of you that are struggling with exactly this topic around implementation. And then we're gonna get into the real meat of today's webinar, which is discussing a framework for implementation of Identity Zero Trust in the context of a tool that I'm calling the four implementation pillars. And the purpose of this is really to help all of you understand where you are in your Zero Trust journey and then from there to figure out what to prioritize and really how to move forward. I'm gonna spend a few minutes after that talking about the company that I work for, uh, which is called Silverfort and where we fit in, in the context of Identity Zero Trust. And then we're gonna end the webinar with a real world example. I always think it's important to go from theory uh, to practice. And so we're gonna look at a very high profile cyber attack that I bet a lot of you are familiar with. We're gonna take a look at exactly what happened in that attack and what could have been done to prevent it. So hopefully all of that sounds good. Again, thanks for joining and let's dive in. So zero, the principles of zero trust, just to go over these. Uh, before we get into more of the meat of the webinar. 
The first one is assume the breach, right? And this one is around the concept that just because an access request is coming from within your network does not mean that it should automatically be trusted, right? There used to be this concept of the firewall, the perimeter. Now, as we know, with a hybrid workplace, that is kind of being, um, it's, it's, it's gone the way of the dinosaurs, right? It, uh, the, 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 the whole perimeter is now, it's everywhere, right? Or there is no perimeter. So you have to assume that there may, that the traffic is not necessarily to be trusted. And that leads to principle number two, which is verify explicitly, right? Just because the access request is coming from within the network doesn't mean it should automatically be trusted. It should be verified. And I like to call this principle the guilty until innocent approach, right? And that leads into principle number three, which is always employ least privileged access, right? This is to make sure that all of your users have the least amount of privilege they need to do their job. Why? Because you don't want tons of users out there with lots of privileged access that they may not necessarily need. You're really inadvertently creating a, a massive attack vector that can, can be exploited by cyber attackers. So you wanna really employ this privilege, uh, this idea of least privileged access. Now, the question here is how do these principles fit into the context or the question of identity zero trust, right? So let's apply them to what we might call the identity control plane, right? And what is the goal here? Well, the goal of the zero trust as it applies to identity is of course, protection from attacks, but protection from attacks that are using compromised credentials to gain access to targeted resources. Now, there are a lot of different attacks out there. Let's take a look at what I'm calling the identity threats landscape, right? There are attacks that are an account takeover, right? Where the, uh, the cyber attacker is able to access your SaaS apps or cloud workloads. There's a malicious remote access attempt. There is lateral movement where the attacker is in your network and moving from machine to machine. Now, what I'd like to propose is that there is in fact a common th theme to all of these attacks, uh, which is they're all using compromised credentials, right? This is really the key aspect of all of these. Identity is usually stolen in the form of a credential and it can be used in, uh, it's very effective once that credential is stolen, right? It can be used in many different parts of the attack progression from the initial access to the lateral movement. And I think what's particularly interesting here if you look at these different types of attacks and think about the different security products that are uh, that are there um, protecting these different resources, you know, you see there's there's a, a wide variety. There's lots of different security products out there. There's the CASB that's protecting your SaaS apps. There's the, uh, the endpoint detection and response systems, the EDR that's protecting the endpoints in your environment. There are different products for network security. But actually, if we look at this through the lens of identity right, the identity protection is actually dispersed uh, among all of these different products. There is not a unified system. There's not a unified platform that is actually protecting the identity across the entire network. And why is this important? Well, let's, let's go back to this idea of the compromised user account and the theme that's running through all of these attacks, right? If we zoom in on, on really what is an identity threat, in almost every case, what we do have is a compromised user attack, a compromised user account, right? They are successfully authenticating to the identity provider, right? They're providing the correct username and password. Um, and so they are able to successfully get into your network, even though it is in fact a malicious attack. They're able to get access to the server. They're able to get access to your SaaS apps. They're able to get access to the database. This is really the common thread between all of the identity threats in, in the environment. So, you know, we've established that identity zero trust is really an urgent concern. But as we think about that, you know, I'm sure there are tons of questions that immediately come to mind as we think about how do we wanna move forward? What do we need to do in order to protect ourselves ourselves against these attacks, right? Where do you even start? You know, what type of environment do you have? And what is the most uh, exposed part of that environment? 
right? How do you assess your environment's readiness? Do you know kind of wh where the weak spots are? What's still missing? Uh, you know, specifically, as I said, there are a lot of different products in the security stack. Um, and, and which of those uh, are, are successfully talking to each other? Do you have, you know, the ability to, to get all of the logs and all of the data from all of these different places? Um, this is an interesting question to think about. Is identity zero trust a zero sum game? And what I mean by that is, do you either have identity zero trust or not? Or is it more of a journey, right? There's something you're always on. And this is really where I'm going to go with this webinar is to help to put some tools out there, put some frameworks in place to help us all figure out where are we in our zero trust journey and what actions do we need to take to move forward? Um, and then furthermore, you know, how do we prioritize those steps? We've got a list of actions we need to take. What, what is the top priority as we move forward? So that is all prelude to really the meat of what I'm now going to talk about on this webinar, which is this idea of an identity zero trust implementation framework, right? So let's think about breaking down this vision of zero trust, right? What are we really trying to do with zero trust in the context of identity, right? What do we need in order to accomplish that goal or move forward? Well, we certainly need continuous monitoring, right? <clears throat> we need the ability to be able to look at the entire environment in real time and see what is going on, right? That's the baseline. And then from there, we need to apply some level of risk analysis. We need to be able to, to determine whether this, uh, what is the behavior this user has been, what's normal behavior for this user? What sort of access or attempts to, are, are they usually requesting? Um, we need to be able to apply our, our smarts and our knowledge around what, what we've seen in the environment or what, what should be allowed in the environment in a risk context. And then of course, to be able to take action, to be able to prevent the attack before it begins, once it's underway, before it goes too far, there has to be an action component of it. So all of that is now leading us to these four pillars. And I'm gonna talk about each one. Uh, we're gonna talk about the concept of unification, uh, also context, enforcement, and granularity. So these are, are, are the, holistically, it's a tool to use in terms of assessing where you are with zero trust and where to go from here. So let's get into it. First, talking about unification, I'm just gonna read the definition here. So unification we're defining as the ability to have 360 degree real-time visibility into every authentication and access attempt across all on-prem and cloud resources made by both human and machine users through any access attempt using any authentication protocol, right? So this is quite a mouthful. It's also quite a challenge for a lot of organizations. And why? Well, it goes back to what I was talking about previously. There are multiple products, a lot of organizations, even the most streamlined ones, you're probably going to have multiple identity silos, right? You probably have a cloud identity provider. You've got something like Azure AD. You probably have an on-prem identity provider. So that's two right out, right out of the gate. Um, you may also have a federation server. You may have a radius server. You may have a PAM solution. It gets very complicated very quickly. But the upshot here is you've got all kinds of places where identity is being managed. There's actually not a single solution that is managing all of the identity. Um, and it's, therefore, it's very complex. It's very, it's very tough to, to have uh, a unified layer of control over all of these, right? And, uh, for example, um, you may be able to get the data from these different uh, directories, but you know, the logs are not necessarily standard. They're all kind of speaking different languages. <clears throat> of course, you've got different types of users that you want to be able to pull data from. You've got privileged users, you've got standard users, you've got service accounts that are performing repetitive actions. You really have a truly fragmented environment here. And so this is why I feel like unification is, is really where you start, right? Because in order to defend yourself against an attack, you first have to be able to connect all of the dots from all of these different places in order to have a unified view. So here are some questions to ask to help figure out where are we in terms of achieving this goal 
or moving along this journey of unification, right? Do you have real-time visibility into all authentications and access attempts, right? I mean, this is really key. Are you able to see things as they happen or are you several steps after that um, as well? Do you have this visibility in a single interface? Yeah, you may have it in the form of lots of logs in lo lots of different places, but do you have the ability to collate all of that information to condense it into a single spot so you're able to make the best decisions? Are you able to discern between standard users and privileged users, right? This is, this is really a baseline. Um, and then can you discover all of your service accounts, right? I mean, service accounts, they may have been created by an admin uh, to eliminate repetitive tasks and then the admin left and now, now no one knows that that service account still exists. So here's a fun question I'd love to throw out to the group here. How many of you can tell me right now how many service accounts you have? I'd love to just see maybe a yes or no. Do you know the answer to that question? If the answer is yes, put the number in the chat here. I just would love to uh, get a get a feeling from all of you. Is this a is this a concern of yours? And and do you actually have this data right now? So unification is the base, right? It's the base from, no, exactly, is the base from which all of the other pillars are built, okay? Because if you don't have a unified view of your environment, you're, you're really not very far into this identity zero trust journey. Let's now talk about the second pillar, which is context. Oh, I love this from participant 242. To quote Hamlet, act three, scene three, line 87. No, yes, that's that's one of my favorite quotes from Hamlet. I love that. Thanks for jumping in. Uh, okay, back to context. Context is the ability to continuously create a behavioral baseline profile for every user account, right? Based on its entire authentication activity across all enterprise resources, enabling reliable and high precision risk analysis for every new authentication attempt to determine whether a given user can be trusted to access a resource or not right in other words are you able to determine from the current from uh, are you able to analyze the current behavior to in the, in the in the sense of like whether it should be trusted or not based on previous behavior okay so let's take a look at this graphic here i know it's a bit primitive but just bear with me so what you see here is a user trail, right? The user is logging into their machine as normal at 9 a.m. on a Monday. They are first accessing a database. And then after that, they are perhaps accessing a cloud app like Office 365. Then they're doing some remote access into another machine. They're accessing a server there. So if you're looking at this behavior um, just in isolation, right? Maybe you're looking at each access attempt you're really not getting the full context of whether this behavior is normal or not, right? What you need to be able to do is to, to determine whether this behavior is normal for this user doing these activities at this time of day. You need to be able to analyze that. You need to be able to get the data from that, right? I mean, you may see that a, let's go back to service accounts, right? You may see a service account is suddenly logging into all different types of systems, uh, very unusual for that service account because it had always performed the same activity at the same type of day. Do you have the ability not just to, to see the service account, but actually look at its behavior and determine is that unusual behavior, right? If you can't see everything within its proper context, you're not actually able to identify the patterns, which means you, you can't take any action. You can't take right action. Um, so here are some questions to think about in terms of context. Do you have a risk engine that can ingest all of your authentication data? Do you have a, a seam or something like that? Um, do you have a single engine that can cover all of your authentications or is it more dispersed? Do you have a lot of different engines covering different types of authentications? Do you have more of a fragmented environment? Can your risk engine reliably determine whether any given authentication is legitimate or malicious. So this is really the key here, right? Because as we know, in the case of lateral movement, you know, the attacker has successfully authenticated 
and they're using those compromised credentials to move through your environment, it looks exactly like a, a, a legitimate user. Without the context, you don't know that this is actually malicious access. access. So that's really our, our KPI for, um, for context, being able to determine that despite the fact that the credentials are valid, we know we're able to identify that this is malicious behavior because of the context. All right, let's move on to the third pillar, which is really where the rubber hits the road, right? This is enforcement. Do you have the ability to trigger secure access controls via configured policy access across every type of user, every interface, every resource, in order to prevent in real time any malicious activity that's using compromised credentials to access targeted resources, right? In other words, this is the ability to take the unified view of your whole environment and the context of each access request and turn that data into actual activity, turn it into enforcement. Blocking access, enforcing MFA, doing something to stop the attack from either beginning or progressing. This is the benchmark of enforcement. And here are some helpful questions to ask yourself. Can you enforce rule-based access policies across all of your resources and risk-based policies, right? Do you have that ability to do that across every resource in, in your environment? And furthermore, can you apply multi-factor authentication, MFA, to all of those resources and all of those access interfaces, right? Emphasis on the word all, because if, there, if the answer is no, if it's not all, then there is a path, right? There is a path that a, an attacker can take to get into and move through your environment. And can you block malicious access in real time, right? This is, this is a, a real key um, component of this. Um, we've got lots of different security products and they're, they're feeding us lots of data, but it's, it's really that ability to do this in real time that kind of separates, moves you further down the zero trust journey. All right, the last pillar I'd like to talk about is granularity. And this is an interesting one because the first three build on each other, right? Unification, seeing the whole environment, context, seeing the, um, the background of each user's um, behavior, and then being able to take enforcement. But granularity is interesting because it, it kind of applies to, to each one of those, right? It's the ability to apply the entire zero trust flow to every single resource access, right? Enforcing the user to regain trust with every new access attempt while never assuming that prior access is sufficient to regard the user as trusted, right? Always being able to do that to every single access attempt in every single context and every single resource. So if we take a quick look at our diagram here, here we see three machines, machine A, B, and C. They're all part of the same network segment. And you know, network segmentation, it's great. That's a great uh, best practice. Um, however, you know, the, the, because of the segmentation, there would be a single security checkpoint. That would be the gateway into that segment. And what if the attacker was able to actually bypass that security checkpoint? Well, then they'd have access to, to all of the machines on, on that segment, right? So our goal here is to apply a level of granularity to every single resource, not just segments of machines or, or, or parts of systems, right? To be able to control that level of granularity. And here are some questions to think about in terms of granularity, can you apply the zero trust flow on the level of every resource access? Like I mentioned, not just the segments, but the machines themselves. And you can you also control additional parameters that may be helpful, such as the connection, uh, the connection length of time, um, maybe the time of day that the resource is being accessed or the device that's being used. How granular can you get, right? So these are our four pillars. Um, I'd like to now show you a slide that combines all of them into a single questionnaire. 
And if you would like a takeaway right now from this webinar, I would say this is a great screen to take a quick screenshot of. I, I know the slides will be available afterwards, but if you wanna grab a quick screenshot of this, these are all of the questions that I have gone over in the context of each of their pillars. And I think it's a very, very useful exercise to go through each of these and really try to figure out what it, what's the answer here to, to all of these very important questions around identity zero trust. Which of these can you answer yes to? Which of these is the answer no? And if the answer is no, well, how much effort is going to be required in order to make that answer yes, right? Is it a small amount of effort, medium, large? I think this is a really useful questionnaire. Um, and I'd like to propose that uh, the company that I work for, Silverfort, we are actually able to answer yes to every single one of these questions. And the reason is we have built a platform that's really designed to be a centralized interface where we're able to monitor and control every single authentication that takes place within your environment. And this is regardless of the type of user we're talking about, whether it's an admin, a standard user, a service account, whether it is a SaaS application, uh, on-prem server, a cloud workload, um, some type of remote connection, whatever it is, um, we have built a platform where the goal was to unite everything so that we can give companies this ability to have a unified view of their environment as well as the context of each of these access requests so they can translate that into uh, an active enforcement, right? An MFA or a block access whenever a risk is detected, whenever there's some sort of suspicious activity. So I'd like to spend a couple of minutes just walking through how it works here. So what we have in the environment, right? We have users, admins, we have service accounts. They are all accessing different resources. Um, they are all authenticating to an identity provider, right? Could be on-prem, could be cloud. And that identity provider is checking to see if the username and password matches, right? And if it does, they're allowing that access. If it doesn't, they're denying it. Sounds fine. Right, but you know, as we've talked about, when it comes to compromised credentials, this is not enough. It's not enough because once you once you have compromised, once you have credentials, stolen credentials, the attacker is able to get into your, to, into your environment, and the behavior can look completely normal until it doesn't. Right. So this is really where Silverfort comes in. And what we do is we sit behind the identity providers, right? So after this is, uh, after the user um, checks in with the username and password with the identity provider, that authentication request is forwarded to us. So we are looking at the entire environment. We're checking to see if that authentication is legitimate based on the data we have, the context we have about that user and about those systems. We're able to perform a very sophisticated risk analysis, and then we can actually enforce that policy. We can we can send MFA, we can send an MFA request. Uh, this is either through our own MFA. We also integrate with all of the major MFA um, providers, Okta, Ping, Duo, we hook in right with them. So if Duo is sending the MFA request, we forward that to Duo, they send the MFA back to us. Once we have that information, right, we've got a full context of the, of the user and we have the response from the MFA prompt, we are then able to reach a verdict, right? You might call us, we're sort of the second opinion behind the identity providers. We, we determine the verdict is, what the verdict is, we pass that verdict on to the identity provider who then takes the action of whether they are gonna allow that access or block that access based on the verdict. Now, um, we're getting kind of toward the end of, of the material that I have here, but I, like I said, I always like to end with a real world example of a high profile attack. And so I'd like to talk for a few minutes about the infamous colonial pipeline attack. Uh, this was a ransomware attack that took place in May of last year. 
It was, in fact, the largest cyber attack on infrastructure in U.S. history. Uh, it was a very big deal. The Colonial Pipeline ended up getting shut down for about a week, which led to massive fuel shortages all across the southeastern U.S. Uh, there was panic buying that happened. The president declared a state of emergency. Airlines were canceling flights and rescheduling flights uh, because of this fuel shortage. So it was a very, very big deal and unfortunately could be a harbinger of, of bigger, badder things to come. But what's, you know, what's relevant for our discussion today is talking about how did this attack happen? Like, what was the thing that got it started? And the answer is it was because of compromised credentials, right? There are tons of, comp of credentials for sale on the dark web. So here's another uh, trivia question, if you will, I want to throw out to everyone. How many compromised, uh, how many credentials are there for sale right now on the dark web? Don't Google it. Don't Google it. Just take a guess. I'm going to give you a hint. It is north of 1 billion. And I just want to see if anyone has an idea how many credentials are for sale right now on the dark web. Just want to see if there are any answers that come in and then I can give you the answer at the end of this. Um, so while billions, correct, yes. But how many How many billions is the question? Um, okay, let's take a look at this at this attack, right? So the five billion, okay. It's, it's more than five, believe it or not. Um, how did this attack progress? Okay, so the, the, um, the attacker had compromised credentials and they were able to use those to log in to what at the time was an inactive VPN. So they kind of came in through the back door there. The VPN did not have uh, MFA on it. And then once they were in the system, they were able to use some remote protocols. So they used uh, PS exec, uh, followed by remote desktop protocol to move through the environment. This is a very common attack vector that we see. And then from there, they ended up at the domain controller, right? They were able to get all the way to the nerve center of the network. And then from there, it's just a question of pushing out the ransomware, right? To endpoints all across the network and then pushing the button, flipping the switch, right? Executing the ransomware on the machines and boom, they're in, they've got it. The ransomware is activated and, you know, um, all hell breaks loose. Um, okay, here are some good some good uh, good guesses. Twenty billion and twenty three. That's very close. The answer is twenty five. Twenty five billion credentials for sale on the dark web. Okay, so that's Colonial Pipeline uh, attack in a nutshell. That's what happened. But let's take a look at what could have happened and how it could have been prevented if there had been a solution like Silver Fort in play, okay? So first of all, let's take a look at this initial access, right? The attacker is using compromised credentials to um, authenticate to this VPN. They're getting into the network, but this is a previously inactive machine, right? So there's something suspicious about that. So being able to, to, to detect, being able to have this unified view of the whole environment and detect that, wait a minute, this is a VPN that hadn't been active. It's suddenly being authenticated. That looks unusual. That looks unusual. That would have, that kind of would have, would have stopped it in its tracks. But let's say they actually were able to get through that and move forward, right? Well, the next, uh, the, the, the path of the user through the network, right? Looking at how they are then using PSXEC and using RDP and getting all the way to the, to the domain controller, this is very unusual context. This is not context that has happened before for this user and for these machines. So this also would have been a huge red flag that could have been thrown up right away had there been a system in place to detect it. And then if we talk about enforcement, right, both on the VPN access and on the remote protocols, as well as on the network sharing, there could have been an MFA in place to stop that attack, to stop that ransomware for actually being from actually being propagated. And then if we talk about granularity, again, it's this ability to be able to provide some sort of enforcement 
on every single one of these access attempts, right? To stop what I would call an error chain. Now, an, an error chain is a concept that is used uh, by accident investigators. So if you ever are reading about, you know, these terrible plane crashes, it's never one thing that went wrong, right? It's always a series of things that collectively led to this terrible plane crash, right? It could have been a design flaw. It could have been uh, a piece of equipment that failed. It could have been operator error. It could have been you know, the, the weather of the day or the environment, but it's never one of these things that leads to the leads to the crash. It's one leading to another, to another, to another. That is the error chain. And that's exactly what we saw with Colonial Pipeline. They were able to, you know, it was a, a human made error chain or an error, an error of not being able to detect these, these, um, these pieces of movement that led to the cyber crisis. Right, and this is what I would say Silver Fort is able to prevent, right? We are able to stop that attack error chain really either before it begins, before it accelerates or before it gets to its final target and execute something like ransomware. Folks, that is all of the material I have to go over with you today. I told you we'd be ending a little bit um, early. Um, we do have plenty of time for Q&A. And so I am going to take a look at our questions that have come in here. I do see a few questions that I'd like to answer. Let's see. Um, how are you able to get visibility into every authentication and access attempt? Yeah, that is a, that's an excellent question. So the answer to that one is we have Silverford built a native integration with every single one of the identity providers, right? Regardless of whether it's a PAM, uh, Active Directory, Federation Server, we have a native integration with that, which means you know, instantly, whenever there's any sort of access request, the IDP is immediately forwarding that to us, right? They're passing that request on to us. We have some proprietary technology that's able to analyze that request, again, within the, the context of the full environment, right? The, the history and the normal behavior patterns of this user or of this service account, right? And because we have that data, we're able to see that we are able to determine, that we were able to give a verdict, if you will, of whether this access should be granted, whether this behavior is normal or malicious. And we send that opinion back to the IDP. Um, and then from there, the IDP is able to ultimately take the enforcement action. So let's say, for example, we see a, a user has uh, logged into Office 365, and then they also um, often log into PowerShell to access some different resources. We're able to determine that that is in fact legitimate. So we can really be kind of the single source of truth for determining all of the different access requests and, and really connecting the dots between all of these, all of these different and, and disparate identity providers. So I hope, hope that answers the question. Um, another question we have here is, how can you enforce MFA on protocols that don't support it? Yeah, that's, that's, that's an interesting one. You know, with that one, I would say um, we are protocol agnostic, right? We, we're not actually focused on the protocols themselves, right? Because there is still going to be a request that comes, the, the protocol is still authenticating to the, um, to the identity provider, right? So, so Active Directory is still sending us the authentication request, right? Um, we're able to, to analyze that request regardless of the protocol that it has come from, right? It's still coming through Active Directory. They're still passing us the same level of information and we're still able to enforce it based on that. Um, a couple more questions here. So I see one that says, can Silverfort replace an IAM product or a totally different product? Yeah, that's interesting. So we, we are not an IAM product. Well, uh, if we go back, maybe I'll just 
go back here very quickly to this slide. We sit behind the, the IAM solutions, right? So we are sort of the supplement to them. We are able to, to do an additional level of analysis that they are not able to do. So we complement them very well. We're not competing with them, right? We're not competing um, with, the, um, with the Octas and the Pings of the world. We're not competing with Active Directory. We are actually sitting right between those two layers trying to provide this additional level of analysis. Uh, I think I might have time for, for one more question here and then I'll let you all go. Um, question is, does Silverfort not include an amount of overhead which might affect performance and hence the user experience? Yeah, that is an interesting one. Um, so we are proxyless and we are agentless. Um, and so we we actually are not taking up a lot of resources on the environment. There's not anything that has to be installed separately uh, on domain controllers. It's a very, very light product. And actually, in most cases, um, there is no effect whatsoever on, on the network activity. It's really indiscernible because, again, we're kind of sitting in this very specific spot only looking at the actual access requests that come in. So it's it's a surprisingly surprisingly light solution in terms of actually its um, its its energy consumption or its um, its network resource consumption. Folks, I think that's all the time that uh, we have for the questions. I want to thank all of you for participating today. I really appreciate your time here. Um, any questions that I did not get to? Um, we will get back to you with a written answer on those. And again, thanks again. I think this webinar is going to be recorded in case anyone was not able to attend. And Cody, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a real pleasure. Don, thank you for coming on and, and spending time with us today. We really appreciate all the, the time and effort that goes into putting these programs together. So thank you so much for, for taking time out to join us. Absolutely. I would like to remind our audience that this session was recorded. So following this program, you'll receive an email with a link to access that recording on demand, or you can find it living on the Security Boulevard website at securityboulevard.com slash webinars, and just be sure to look in the on demand section. So we do still have those four $25 Amazon gift cards to give out. Our first winner is Eleni T. Our second winner is Victor G. Our third winner is Sumitra M. And our fourth and final winner is Bobby J. So to our four winners, congratulations. Please keep an eye on your inbox to claim that gift card. But if you do not see that email, do check your spam folder. I would like to thank Silverfort for sponsoring today's program and making this webinar possible. And to our audience, we really appreciate you spending time with us today. We do ask for just one extra moment of your time to fill out a brief survey that should pop up as soon as we close out. But otherwise, we do hope to see everyone at an upcoming Tech Strong Learning program. Everyone have a great rest of your day. And Don, thank you once more. Yep, thank you. Thank you all.